Good morning and welcome to my father's place. Today my message is entitled God of the Valleys. And you may have heard this preached many times, but the Lord has given me a very specific way that he wants me to speak to you about this. I will pray and then we will begin. Father, I thank you that you give the anointing, that you give the revelation, that you give the word. And all we do is act as vessels for you through whom you can speak. That's all I am for you, Lord, that you know that I serve you and I love you. And so you're faithful to give these things. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your life. I thank you for the power that you gave through the Holy Spirit. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for sanctification, for taking me out of this world, making me holy, put me back in, and keeping me that way. I can't do it. It's your holiness. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way in me and in everyone who watches. In Jesus' name, amen. God of the valleys. Now, what I want you to know is whether you are fighting Satan and his vast armies on a mountain or in the valley, God will give you the victory. The Lord will give you the victory if you will listen to him, if you will listen to those who he sends. He will give you victory. Hallelujah. Why? Because he's not just the God of the mountains. He's not a God who can only work in a certain place. He's everywhere all the time. Highs, lows. And you will have, beloved, spiritual highs and spiritual lows in this way and this way only if you're following hard after him. You will have times when, it's, when you are on a mountain. And consider, think about it. What's it like for an army that's on a mountain watching an army down below approaching? Not only can you see them way in advance, but you can determine their strategy by watching how they are arrayed, how they're set up. So you see them long before they get to you. And you can determine what their strategy is long before they get to you. And then to get to you, they have to climb up. So it's very easy to knock them back down. So in a situation like that, spiritually speaking, it's very easy to trust God for the victory. You are in a position where you can see. You are in a position where you can determine. You are in a position where it's hard for the enemy to get to you. But there are also spiritual valleys. I'm not talking about the ones that are caused by you sinning against the Lord. He'll set you free from that if you want him to, if you ask him. But I'm talking about times when all of us who love and obey him simply cannot see and advance the enemy's attack. And that, for us, is a valley. And when you're in a valley, when you're on a plain, when you're in a place that's flat, and you're standing down there, and the enemy's coming at you, you can only see a little bit of him, and you, can, you really can't see the whole array of how he's coming at you to determine what your strategy should be to fight him. And so... In that place, beloved, it's much harder to trust God for the victory because it came upon you, the enemy has come at you unexpectedly and in a way that you didn't, couldn't foresee because you couldn't see. There are times when you can't see. Now, God doesn't put you in those positions because he's mean and he wants to play with you. He puts you in those positions so you'll trust him all the more. When you are in a valley as an obedient son or daughter, 
of God the Father. It is to grow your faith. It is to grow you in your trust and belief that God will give you the victory. No matter what, no matter how unexpected the attack or the ploys of the enemy, you will believe God. He wants you to grow in that always. He's been growing me in that. Hallelujah. I praise God for it. Now, in the situation in the scripture we're going to look at, which is 1 Kings 20, there was a sinning nation, Israel. God's people were sinning against him in a major way. Their king was Ahab. His wife was Jezebel. They were quite a pair. He was worshiping Baal, worshiping the gods of the land, worshiping fertility gods, doing all kinds of things that were not of God. And the enemy had come. And in 1 Kings 20, verse 1, it says, Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, gathered all his army, and there were 32 kings with him, and horses, and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and fought against it. Now Samaria is northern Israel. The kingdom of Israel had been broken up with Judah to the south and Samaria to the north. So we're talking about northern Israel, which was deep in idolatry. And so the enemy came and fought against Israel. And as this battle was progressing, messengers came. Ahab and said, oh, well, if you give me your wives and your children and this and that, uh, we can make peace. Uh, never believe the enemy if he tries to bargain with you, beloved. In verse 8 of First Kings 20, he says, it says, all the elders and all the people said to him, that is King Ahab, do not listen or consent. And so that's what he told Ben-Hadad. He said, I can't do what you're asking. And in verse 10, this interesting thing happens, which is really a turn of events that Ben-Hadad doesn't realize is happening. In verse 10, Ben-Hadad sent to him Ahab, and said, May the gods do so to me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria will suffice for the handfuls for all the people who follow me. Now, what did he mean in that? What was he boasting? He was boasting that all of his vast army, if each one picked up some dust from Samaria, there wouldn't be enough left of Samaria for each one to have enough dust to put in their hand. The whole goal was obliteration. That was what he was saying. I'm going to totally obliterate northern Israel. This was before they engaged in a great battle. So he went and he boasted. Well, I'll tell you what, beloved, the enemy will boast. He will boast. And that is very key. God will respond to the enemy's boastings. Because he won't let anyone, including the enemy, glory in his presence. And he will not let the enemy get away with a boast without turning it around. The enemy could boast all they wanted. He was going to do what he planned to do. God was going to do what he planned to do. And what did he plan to do? Verse 13. Now behold, a prophet approached Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says the Lord, Have you seen all this great multitude? That would be Ben-Hadad's armies and the 32 kings that were with him and their armies. Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, 
I will deliver them into your hand today and you shall know that I am the Lord. An absolutely impossible situation, but he is the God of the impossible. He is God who will do things that look too difficult, but nothing is too difficult for God. And so he said, I will deliver you from this army that is an amazingly large army, hundreds of thousands of men coming against Israel. Why? Because of the boast of the enemy and because of the sin of that nation, Israel, his people. He was going to show his people He was going to show King Ahab, and he was certainly going to show Ben-Hadad that he is Lord, and there is no other. You shall know that I am the Lord, he says through the prophet to Ahab. Not these gods that you're following. These aren't God. I am God. And I'm going to show you by delivering you, even though you're sinning against me. Because if I show you that I and only I am God, you will know by experience that that is true. And if you know by experience that that is true, you have this great opportunity to return to me. And if you return to me, I will return to you in a much greater way than winning a battle against a natural enemy. And I tell you, beloved, he wants to show you today that he is God and there is no other. He wants to show you today that he can bring you to a place where no weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue that is raised up against you in judgment you will condemn, where you are not condemnable before the Lord in any way, shape, or manner. But even, even for a sinner, he will do that so that you know by experience. And for those who are not sinning, those who love and obey God, those who love Jesus, those who have come to God the Father through God the Son, those who are filled with his Holy Spirit, you can be absolutely assured of victory because you have those promises. Absolute assurance of victory that he who is in you, in you, That's the operative word. He who is in you, if he is in you, and if he's large and in charge, there is nothing that can come against you. The prince of this world, Satan, has nothing on you. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Greater than Satan and all his vast armies. That is your promise if you love and obey and have come to God the Father through God the Son and you've been filled with his spirit so your heart is pure and you hate sin like God hates sin and you will not have anything to do with sin and you are no longer a slave to sin, beloved. So they're in trouble. Ben-Hadad makes the boast. God says, ha, that's what you think. And the prophet speaks. Now, I want to read to you from my notes on this. That if you are in sin, the reason he may give you a word that you will be victorious in a battle with Satan is so that you will experience, I want to emphasize this, you will experience You will know by experience that he is God and there is no other. And you will have the opportunity to turn. He will free you 
from addiction to drugs, praise be to God. From alcoholism, praise be to God. From homosexuality, praise be to God. But if you go back to it like a dog to its vomit, if you refuse what he's giving you, if you reject what he's giving you, if you continue to, to be like on a choke chain that Satan pulls and you got to go or choke to death, if you continue in that, The wages of sin is death, beloved. You cannot have an experience, a knowing, because God has rescued you, even though you're sinning against him. You cannot have an experience of being having some chains broken off you and not turning to him completely. You cannot do that. I have seen people who were deep in many sins, who were freed from alcoholism but continued in those sins afterward. They had the experience. It wasn't through AA. It was an instantaneous thing that God did, a work of God, completely removing the desire for, for alcohol from someone. But they continued in their other sins and they are completely in darkness now, continuing in their ways because they rejected God's offer through this experience to turn. They rejected that offer. God help us. But if you turn back to him, if you turn to him, if you turn from your sins, he will take away that desire for sin from you. And you will be among those who are assured victory in every circumstance. Ahab eventually died in a battle that came later. You, as a child of God who loves and obeys and is filled with the Spirit, will be victorious every time, be it mountain or be it valley. Praise be to God. That's what he offers you today. In verse 15, even though there was this vast army coming against the sinning people, verse 15, then he, that is Ahab, mustered the young men of the rulers of the provinces, and there were 232. And after them he mustered all the people, even all the sons of Israel, 7,000. Why were there so few? Wasn't northern Israel a big area? They had been in famine for three and a half years, beloved, because of their sin. And the famine had ended when Elijah went to the mountaintop and prayed for rain. But the famine had killed many. Many had died of starvation during that famine. So there were not many left. See, that's when the enemy loves to attack, is when there's not much, when you're weak. When you're weak, when you're vulnerable. And sin makes you weak and vulnerable to the enemy. He will attack you at those times. And then, in verse 19, he says, These young men and that small army of 7,000 went out from the city. And verse 20 says, 20 and 21, relate that they massacred the huge Aramaic army and all of those kings, the 32, it says. So these went out from the city, the young men of the rulers of the provinces and the army which followed them, 
Verse 20, they killed each his man, and the Arameans fled, and Israel pursued them, and Ben-Hadad king of Aram escaped on a horse with horsemen. The king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Arameans with a great slaughter. There was a great slaughter of Satan and his minions, of Satan and his vast army. For you, there is a great slaughter that God does. When he frees you from an addiction or from whatever has you held in chains, if he gives you freedom from that, beloved, you run to him. You do not delay. You turn to him because he does great things in order to show you that he is God and that he is the one you should be worshiping, not the God of this world. And he will set you free. Now this battle happened in the mountains. And I know that because of what the king of Aram, what his servants say afterwards. Verse 23. Well, I'll talk about verse 22 first. Because the prophet came back to Ahab and he said, there's going to be another battle. They will assemble again to get you. And it will be in a different place. So go strengthen yourself, he says, and observe and see, verse 22, what you have to do for at the turn of the year, the king of Aram will come against you. Meanwhile, in verse 23, the servants of the king of Aram said to him, their gods are gods of the mountains. That's how I know it was fought on a mountaintop. That's how I know that in that first battle, Israel was in the mountains and the army of Aram and the 32 kings was down below. Because the enemy lost on the mountaintop and because these pagan people thought that gods were regional, like, okay, he's god of the mountains, but there's a different god for the valleys and that's not their god. So the servants say to the king of Aram, their gods are gods of the mountains. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But rather, let us fight against them in the plain, in the valley. And surely we will be stronger than they. If you're a saint and you're attacked in a place where you can see in advance, don't be surprised if the enemy later tries another tactic in a valley. And so, even for this sinning king of northern Israel and his people, another attack came. Let's start with 26. At the turn of the year, just as God had said through the prophet, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And this was a valley. This was a place where all kinds of um, agriculture took place. You can't do that on a mountaintop. Aphek went there to fight against Israel. And in 27, the sons of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went to meet them. And the sons of Israel camped before them like two little flocks of goats. But the Arameans filled the country. Another huge army had been mustered. They had not been in the famine. They had huge numbers to replace those who were killed on the mountains. By Israel. And so here we are again in another situation which looks impossible. And you can't see as far into the as far ahead, you can't see the strategy. You're on the in the valley, you're at the same level as them now. You can't tell how they're going to come at you. You just know there's a lot of them. Verse 28. Then a man of God, there would be no way, and I'll stop and say, no way that Israel should have had victory the first time in the mountains or this time in the valley because in the natural it looked impossible. But beloved, if you're a saint of God, you know nothing's impossible for God. 
And if you are a sinner who has seen that the Lord, he is God, and there is no other, you will know also that nothing is impossible for him. Do not reject him. Verse 28, Then a man came near and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, Because the Arameans have said, The Lord is a God of the mountains, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You shall know by experience, once again, sinning Ahab and sinning northern Israel. You should know, you shall know by experience a second time, even in a situation where you couldn't see in advance, even in a situation where you can't see the strategy, they will lose and you will win, even though you're like two little flocks of goats against a vast army. I will show you again. I so want you to return to me. I so want you to return to me. He says that to you today. I so want you to return to me. I will show you again. And so, again, victory in verse 29. So they camped one over against the other seven days, and on the seventh day the battle was joined, and the sons of Israel killed of the Arameans a 100,000 foot soldiers in one day. A small army of 7,000 and change kills 100,000 of the enemy. Oh, my. One will kill 1,000, two will kill 10,000. Beloved, if you're a saint of God, you will hear and you have experience that the Lord, he is God and there is no other, and you have turned to him. And he will give you victory even when you are like two little flocks of goats against a vast army of the enemy. And O sinner who calls themselves Christian, this is about God's people. This isn't about people who don't believe. This is about God's people who have sinned. If you are one of God's and you have sinned, he will tell you, he will show you even twice so that you will know by experience that he is the Lord and there is no other so that you might turn to him. Hallelujah. What a gracious God you have that even though you have willfully disobeyed him. And that's what I mean by sin. You have willfully disobeyed him. You have set your hat against him, and you have stuck your tongue out at him, and you have said, I'm going to do what feels good to me. He will give you chances to turn because he is gracious and merciful. He will give you victories so that you might see that he is God. When I first was looking at this, I said, why did you even help Israel? Part of it is his reputation. Part of it is God's reputation. When the king of Aram boasted, and when the king's servants said, well, he's God of the mountains, but he's not God of the valleys, they were thumbing their nose at God. They were belittling him. And I tell the world, beware of belittling God. He will have victory. He will have the victory. I'll tell you. He will give you every chance to turn. And for you who know him, you are assured Every time, the enemy will be beaten back. Hallelujah. He doesn't say that you won't have storms. Jesus says, in the midst of them, if you're standing on the rock, which is my word and my truth, you won't be swept away by what comes. But Ahab and his gang, 
Ahab and northern Israel, they were standing on sand. And eventually they got washed away. There was a time, like I told you, that Ahab was killed in battle. And it was just according to the way the prophet had said. And there was a time after that when Assyria totally overwhelmed northern Israel and carried everyone away into captivity. Because they didn't turn, even after they knew by experience, that only the Lord is God. He delivered his own people who were sinning against him so that they would throw their idols to the moles and the bats. Just throw them away as useless and worthless. And he's asking you to do that. If you've got idols, if you've got, if you're sinning against God willfully, you don't have to have a little, little, pick, little uh, model of a man standing here. You don't have to be carrying that around in your pocket. It's what's in your heart that's where the idolatry happens. And so he wants to free you from that. He wants you to know and he will show you by various means that he is the only God. And if you receive that and you turn, you will be saved. But if you continue in your sin, you may call yourself one of God's, but sin results in death, beloved. There will be judgment for you. There will be judgment for you. So turn, turn. He is the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys, and there is no other God. So whatever God, including you, yourself, me, myself, and I, that you might have, Throw that away and come to him today. And there will be no mountain and no valley where you are defeated. Ahab was defeated. The whole of northern Israel was defeated. You will not be if you turn. If you don't turn, it will be the same for you as Ahab and northern Israel. He says, oh, today... Come to the God of the mountains and the God of the valleys. You who are Christians, who follow hard after Christ, who obey him, who have had their hearts purified, who have God in them, I tell you, every promise of victory in this word is yours. No matter if you can see the enemy way ahead of time or if you're in a valley where you're saying, I'm perplexed, Lord, I don't know what's going on. He will give you victory either way. Because of his great mercy, the Lord gives victory even to those who are sinning against him. That they may know by experience that he is God and there is no other and that they may turn. Great mercy. For those who obey Christ, victory is always yours, whether you can see it or not, whether things look bleak or not. You can stand on the entire word of God, which tells you that if you live for him, and if you have allowed him to take your slavery to sin from you if you have allowed him to put in you his holiness and his righteousness and his power and his love so that you hate sin in you and in others like he does. If you do those things, these are yours. These are yours. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue lifted up against you, you will condemn. 
And because he's in you, the one who is greater than the prince of this world, Satan, is in you. Satan is defeated every single time. Every single time. Lord, let your sinning people return to you when you have shown them time and time again that you are the one and only God. Let them throw their idols, including the idol of I, me, and my, to the moles and the bats of God, so that they would be assured of victory by the God who is God of all things, the mountains and the valleys, the mountains and the valleys, that there is no place where they will not have victory against the enemy. May they return to you, your sinning people, Lord, Israel and the church, And Lord, give your saints assurance even now with this message that all your promises for them are yes and amen. Jesus, I give you glory that you are the amen. You have the final word. You are the truth. And you are the so be it. Let it be so even now. Holy Spirit, send this forth in your power For it is you, O oh God, who is at work in us to prove to the world around us that you are the one and only God. Victory is ours, O oh saints. In Jesus' name, amen.